feel like Gordon Bombay would have taken his career to even further heights. Everything's flashy, everything's cocaine, everything's fun. Open wide for some soccer. I don't care what you think about, what your personal thoughts are at home. I care that you hate the Cowboys. Call this college rule! Welcome back, everybody. It's uh, Dom and Chris here with the Sports Experience Podcast. Uh, just a couple comics who love talking sports, cracking jokes, and uh, maybe a little, uh, you know, learning action here today. Yeah, sometimes we uh, actually we always get into some facts and some uh, deep stories. So. Deep stories, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, we're back on the hardwood today. Yeah, yeah talking the great Hakeem the Dream Elijah Wan. Oh yeah. Um, we were spelling it out for our producer, and he said that's not a word. <laughs> I said that's xenophobic. <laughs> oh, jeez. We have to record in a new space now. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Hakeem the Dream, born January 21st, 1963 in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Um, born to Muslim parents Salim and Abike in a working class Yoruba uh, family, who, and they owned a cement business yeah. there, which is pretty cool. I said he grew up in a pretty regular cosmopolitan city, but... Uh, yeah, people would always say, like, oh, wow, you're from Africa. It's mm-hmm. like, no, Lagos is, like, a large city. Yeah. Like, you know, millions of people live there. Yeah. <laughs> um, third of eight children, so a very large family. Uh, didn't grow up playing soccer. No. Or, uh, basketball, excuse yeah. me. Yeah, I found that interesting, but is kind of... For the area where his main sport was soccer and other, you know, handball sports, too. handball, yep. And that's kind of where he developed his quick feet, which we'll see in the NBA for a big man, because um, he's a very large individual. Yeah, uh, he was also a opinion. goalkeeper, which yeah. he said he loved, uh, he brought to blocking shots, which yeah. I, I love that. He was just like, oh, no, I can keep my eye on the ball. Get so. that stuff out of here yeah. right now. Um, he uh, really, um, a very family-oriented dude. He grew up in a really good family. Uh, one of the quotes I did want to bring up um, about his parents um, and how they raised their kids, uh, he said, they taught us to be honest work hard, respect our elders, and believe in ourselves. Yep. And that is all you can ask, really, Mm -hmm. I think. And it kind of, it shows through in his professionalism and his work ethic that you'll see uh, in his professional career. Yeah, definitely. So he finds basketball at the age of 15, because I feel like he hits this growth spurt and he's 6'6", or whatever he is at that point. Um, and the quote that I saw that I loved was as soon as he found basketball, he was just like, Oh, all other sports just became obsolete. Yeah. And it's just like, he found his calling. Yeah. Like it was just like, uh, basically a hand in a glove, if you will. Um, but, uh, he plays bad. One of the stories was, um, they were teaching him how to play basketball and one of the coaches stood up on a chair to dunk the ball, to show him how to dunk it. And so Hakeem climbs up on the chair and they're like, no, you have to stand on the floor and do this. And I guess the first time he tried dunking it, he couldn't, Yeah, which is crazy. Well, he just, it, you could see he just really didn't understand basketball at 15, even though his body was, you know. Yeah, it was still growing. Um, but uh, by the time he is out of the uh, teacher's college that he's attending, he's ready uh, to maybe take his basketball to the next level and take it to the States. Well, he gives the Houston coach a call. Yes, he does. Uh, Guy Lewis. Mm-hmm. And he says, hey, um, I want to come to Houston and play for your basketball team. I'm six, seven, six, eight. Mm-hmm. The, that's what he says over the phone. And this is what I found so interesting was there were, really wasn't like – footage of him out there there wasn't anything like that he was just like these are my numbers from my nigerian school where i think he actually won a a championship Mm -hmm. there yep and i want to come out and try out for the basketball team and they just said sure you can come out and have like a meet and greet and a little tryout and it was so they they weren't expecting anything cuz what it, what guy said was when somebody calls and says hey i'm this tall yeah. you immediately knock 2 3 inches off exactly like you're going to get catfish this was the uh prime time for that and you don't really have even grainy footage like sabone zone and lithuania at the time you it's know it's exactly like those dating apps every time it's yeah. just you knock a couple of inches off yeah, you know knock a couple of inches off. just saying <laughs> but uh he gets to Houston and there's nobody there at the airport no well they said he can take a cab that's literally what the coaching staff said but which is 
normally they would pick him up from the airport kind of thing. And this is 1980, by the way, this is 1980. Mm -hmm. They have him take a cab and he shows up. And this is one of my favorite things is they see him getting out of the cab and the assistant coach goes, and he just keeps getting out of the cab (laughs) and he keeps getting out of the cab. And we realize, Oh, this guy isn't six, seven, six, eight. He's six, 10. Yeah. You know, because he's grown since the man of my dreams. Yes, exactly. When you see a chick, like, you know, you're online dating, like bumble, or hinge or whatever and then like you see her in person and she's like maybe even prettier you're just like oh i made the right decision i'm gonna have to knock a couple of inches off (laughs) and then the coach literally sees him getting out of the cab and goes go fetch his bag get him in here right now this is what guy says because he sees essentially a big man Yeah, potential for a program that uh is really turning the corner at the time yeah and putting a couple of extra inches on guy v lewis below the shorts if Whoa. you know what i'm talking Whoa. about <laughs> but he sits out 80 81 um, red shirts because of uh various international um, yeah because playing bureau- loss yeah. bureaucracy and yep. all that other stuff but uh in 81, 82, he's basically their sixth man. They put him kind of right in the rotation there and uh, does a pretty good job for him. Uh, 8.3 points a game, 6.2 rebounds, and uh, two and a half blocks in just under 20 minutes a game. Well, what was said about his first year was he was obviously completely raw. Oh, yeah. And he was a liability on the offensive side. So defensively, he picked that up right away. You're going to put he him was, in the paint, yeah. <laughs> and that's what they were saying was like – if you want to make that next step, you because something that was so funny that you never even think of growing up having like little moves, he was just like he had no offensive moves whatsoever. He's so if he, than everybody. If, if he caught the ball and stuffed it back in, that was it. But he wasn't posting people up. He wasn't doing any anything for himself. There was no individual. Um, ability there but he has the athletic background as far as soccer and handball and the footwork where it's like oh well if we just show him this a couple of times then he'll just do it and he'll invent it himself well and the ability and something that they were saying was he didn't have all of these learned things wrong so like he literally was a clean slate so they were like he just needs time to develop these skills because he didn't grow up in america like playing high school ball like he starts at 15 but i mean like not you know junior aau that type of thing so he has no coaching it's just like raw clay that you can mold into a freak well to think that literally he was starting playing basketball and they were like here try and dunk it (laughs) like that was his starting point where they they were like no no no, you should be able to dunk this ball and he's just like, no, nah, I don't get even how to dribble. And no disrespect to, you know, the coaching staffs in Nigeria, but it's not like America where basketball was invented. Yeah, you know? no, it's, like, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, he, but they definitely, everybody could see his potential. Um, and then the coaching staff, he was asking him because he wants to be a great basketball so player. Guess this it is, comes in, man. Yeah. And he said, how do I become the starting center of this because they made the final four that year. Yes, they lost this to great Houston North team. Carolina yes. team led by some guy named Michael Jordan who uh, ruins everyone's dreams. Jordan. <laughs> but uh, that offseason was a really pivotal one this for is, him. Yeah. yeah. And so this is what was so awesome was Guy Lewis set it up to have this essentially like this little summer league going on Yeah, where he played against pretty much the Houston Rockets. And Moses Malone, one and, of the greatest big men in NBA history. And Moses Malone was coming off of, I believe, three defensive titles. Yep. Mm-hmm. And just setting them up, this is what everybody was saying, was Moses played him like an NBA player yeah. and pretty much molded him into like this star. Like If he was going to go up for some bullshit, he was just going to put it right back into his face. Exactly. And it. it With that learning curve that summer, which is so crazy to think like this summer, summer. (laughs) but it literally, they were like, he came back a different player. What'd you do on your summer vacation? Did you work at McDonald's? No, I just posted up Moses Malone. (laughs) Oh man. I'll tell you what my favorite college assignment was when Hakeem came back and went, my summer vacation. (laughs) (laughs) You call this college ruled? And he's, you know what? He's just telling the class and they're like, the Moses Malone? (laughs) The faux, faux, faux Moses Malone? Well, they said right at the end of the summer, it was like August, there was this turning point when 
Hakeem goes up, grabs a board, and goes to stuff it back in Moses' face. And Moses goes up, and everybody's like, oh, here comes another block. Because yep. he really was manhandling him in the first you know, parts of this thing. And Hakeem stuffs it in his face. And everyone said, like, oh, shit. Iron sharpens iron, baby. Yeah. That's what it is. That, oh, my God. It's crazy how that – and what Guy Lewis said was just how much he improved on his offensive game in that summer. And, yeah, you had the offense to just, like – a physical freak in the paint defending and you have arguably one of the greatest players in college basketball on arguably one of the greatest teams in college basketball of this era because they're not only getting Hakeem they have Clyde Drexler and Phi Slamma Jamma that's that dunking fraternity we all heard about yeah that dunking fraternity well that's the this is what people were saying was Hakeem in this first year as the sixth man they get to the final four Mm -hmm. this next year when he comes back was the year that they were really supposed to be champions they were they were without a doubt the best team Michael Young, Alvin Franklin, um, and uh, Benny Anders. I mean, that this team just was exciting. Yes. It was awesome to watch them. They they would like... They out. brought the dunk back to college basketball. Yes. They'd run the floor really fast, go fast break, and then this is where having Akeem on your team as a big man who can also run the floor is just like, oh boy, how do you defend that? Well, that was the big thing was they would get the crowd so into it because they would out dunk teams by like 10. And that was essentially because Hakeem was such a great rim protector too. So like the other team weren't able to get these, you know, high energy plays to get the crowd into it. It was just like, ah, man, they were just dunking all over us. Hakeem will get the rebound outlet pass and let the fun begin, man. Yeah, seriously. Um, so that year, he averages 13.9 points a game, which is almost double what he was the year before. Yep. Um, 11.4 rebounds and 5.1 blocks. Like you said, the rim protector. That's yep. crazy to even think, dude. But uh, they roll through the regular season. I mean, they're expected to be champions, and they roll into the Final Four. And God you're thinking after they win the national semifinal, they're going to roll all over North Carolina State. Especially because North Carolina State was not a really good team in this. I mean, let's just be honest. They were a lower seed. They were beset by injuries, but they won the ACC tournament. And had they not, they wouldn't have even been in the NCAA tournament. But this was the era without the shot clock. Yeah. And uh, there was that press conference with Jim Valvano. He said, well, we're going to slow it down a bit. And in that game, that's exactly what they did. They stayed enough in it, and Houston slowed it down when they got the lead, which was contrary to everything that they had been doing that year. And last-second dunk put back by Lorenzo Charles, and they were that close to winning the national title. Hakeem said this, and I think Clyde has also like agreed – Um, When they were talking about looking back at this game, they felt like it was coaching mistakes Yep. where they, like you said, they slowed the game down and they spread the game out. And like Clyde and and Hakeem were like, why would we do that? And Clyde got in foul trouble early, which is terrible. No, yeah. It was everything. It was just like, yeah, that sucks because they really were the best team that year. And then we come back the following year, and Clyde uh, decides to go to the draft. Clyde goes in the draft. He goes to the uh, Portland Trail Blazers. Uh, sadly, no Sabone zone at that juncture. But Hakeem is back. It's always sad when there's no Sabone zone. Yeah, you always want to take a trip to the Sabone zone. But, but that's something that I have to stand by with Hakeem because he could have went out that year. Everybody saw his, yeah. I mean, as a big center. Um, and he said he wanted to come back because he felt like he could have won a national championship with Houston, and he wanted that opportunity. Yeah, and he wants to stay in school. And in 83-84, they're equally as, almost as good without Clyde. Which is crazy. Yeah. But it's more of a Hakeem-centric team. Yeah, it's definitely more in the paint um, as far as strategy. 16.8 points a game, 13.5 rebounds, 3.6 blocks. And they roll all the way to the national championship game again. They roll all the way, and then they run into freaking Georgetown and And Patrick Ewing. Patrick Ewing, um, which it's such an interesting thing because we'll see see old Patty Ewing come back. Oh, we will. But when you look at this Houston team, they really were Final Four, championship game, championship game. Yeah. And it's just crazy to think that they never won one. Couldn't put it together one time, dude. It sucks. They end up losing to Georgetown, but Hakeem was the uh, 
uh, tournament player of the year. Yeah, Last definitely. guy on the losing team because yeah. he was just that dominant. But with no eligibility remaining, he has to go to the draft the next year. Yeah. There's there's no, oh, no question. He, no, well, he has an extra year because of that red shirt. Oh, you're right. This was so, his junior year. And he yeah. was talking about this. They didn't have the draft lottery at this juncture in the NBA. So the year before, the Houston Rockets completely tanked on purpose, like Donald Sterling with those San Diego Clippers. Yep. Um, they ended up drafting Ralph Sampson, great center out of Virginia. We brought him up in the David Robinson episode. Um, so they decided the first pick with the two worst teams in a coin flip. And Hakeem, I don't know whether it's divine intervention or whatever, but he thought Houston, because they were one of the two worst teams with Portland, who Drexler was already on, that uh, he'd get drafted. They'd win the coin toss. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, as luck would have it, as fate would have it, uh, Houston wins. And uh, at the top of this draft, there are two big men, because, only two, because Patrick Ewing decides to go back to Georgetown. It is Hakeem Olajuwon at number one and Sam Bowie at number two. No, well, let me uh, let me tickle you with this one before we. Uh, I before think I know exactly where you're going. I can't wait, let buddy. Let me tickle you with this Ooh. one. Portland comes up after they lose this coin flip, mm -hmm. and they say we have a trade for you. Yeah, to Houston. To Houston, which is Clyde the Glide. Oh yeah, the number two pick. Yep. For Ralph Sampson. Yeah. So if this, I'm just saying. So if this pit, if this. Uh, Trade would have went through. Houston would have had the number one and number two pick, and Clyde, and they would have had to trade Ralph Sampson. I'll get into what happens to Ralph. Poor and Ralph. They said that if this went through, they would have drafted Michael Jordan. Oh, sweet. Could you imagine Clyde Drexler, Michael Jordan, and Akeem the Dream on the same squad? And that's what they were saying was just like that was close to happening this was like this would be for all of you those of you who are snl fans bills worski super fans we're talking minimum eight pete oh my god it <laughs> would have been ridiculous because but this was the thing was everybody thought ralph sampson was going to be the next and kareem would, and he was rookie of the year he, he was, was a great player yes that was the thing he was seven four he was rookie of the year that year and they de Rockets decide to hold on to him. They draft Hakeem, and then we see the first ever uh, Twin Towers. First installment before later Robinson and Duncan with the Spurs. Um, and it works out pretty well for him, 84-85. Um, he's second in Rookie of the Year to some guy named Jordan. Mm -hmm. 20.6 points a game, 11.9 rebounds, and 2.6 blocks. So, I mean, and the team improved rapidly. They That's went from the thing, 29 David. wins to 48 wins. Yep. And I can see the logic behind trying to hold on to Samson because it still was a center-based league. Because there were people in that draft talking about, like, ooh, the Bulls went with Jordan. Why would they do that? They need a big man. Yeah. No, well, just to put it in perspective, nobody was thinking, like, oh, my God, I can't believe the Rockets drafted Hakeem over Jordan. Yeah. This is, like, the big thing. It was a complete big man, especially because they already had a center. Yeah. And they were like, how are these two guys going to work together? This was something that if you watch this 84 to 86 Rockets, yeah. they were amazing. It they was were two, mean too, dude. It was two tall uh, big men who could run the floor. Yeah. And it's crazy. Over seven foot. Over seven. Samson was seven four. Hakeem was about seven one, seven two. Yep. I mean, that's crazy. But uh, 85 86, they improved to 51 wins. Uh, Hakeem has 23.5 points a game, 11.5 uh, rebounds, and 3.4 blocks. And they go on a little postseason run this year. A really impressive postseason run. They uh, make it to the Western Conference Finals, and everyone is assuming the Lakers are going to kick the shit out of them. Last year's champs. Last year's champs, that's right, uh, with Magic Johnson and Showtime. But uh, they stick it to them in that series. They really do. They beat them in five games, dude. It was amazing. Well, this was what Pat Riley said about Hakeem was, we tried everything. Yeah. We put four bodies on him, and he's just a great player. So, like, the thing that rings true about this with having him and Samson out there was like there was no let off and you look at this Lakers team was one of the dynasty teams and the Rockets really destroyed them yeah I mean these I mean in games three and four he had 75 total points I mean that's just insane dude there was just no stopping him if he wanted to score he was going to score yeah um they make it all to the nba finals unfortunately they run into arguably one of the greatest teams not named the 95 96 bulls in the 85 86 celtics i would say the second best team that's yeah. the way i kind of look at this celtics team it's also kind of hard to say but 
this Celtics team was so good, but they were going up against this super young Rockets team. They ended up beating them in six games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Larry Legend out there. Oh, Larry Legend, yeah. And but, uh, Kevin McHale and those short shorts. Oh, man. <laughs> Those those milky milky thighs. Oh God! Um, <laughs> Thank God for the Fab Five. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, Jesus. And, and Jordan putting his shorts longer so he can uh, keep his UNC ones under his uh, Bulls gear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But eighty six, eighty seven. He's just as good. I mean, well, let me say this because everybody's looking at this Rockets team as the future. Yeah. They have these two big men. They're gonna. They were like, we're gonna add to this. This is gonna be like our hopefully dynasty because the Celtics are on a, on their downswing here. Mm -hmm. Um, and we see Ralph Sampson start to get injured, even in 87. Yeah, and when a big man like that gets injured, they just start accumulating. I mean, it's like almost Bill Walton. Yes, it is. The way that it, was. it just declines. And it's so sad because he was so good, dude. Yep. He was great for like three years, and then literally it was like a drop-off. And nothing that was his fault. It was just his body gave up on him, unfortunately. And I wonder if this thought around the Rockets, because they watch it happen to yeah. Sampson, if they are like, like, God, please don't happen to Hakeem because he right. was he was their man forever. And yeah, they were they were good again though in '87. Yeah, uh, make make the playoffs. Um, averages another 23 points a game. Uh, they beat Dallas in the first round, but uh, they lose to Seattle in six games um, in the sem Western Conference semifinals. Uh, but Hakeem did awesome in that postseason. Averaged almost 30 a game, man. Because yep. he's now the focal point. Yep. There's this is kind of the end of the Twin Towers in Houston era essentially but uh 87 uh 88 samson's eventually traded yeah to he's Golden traded State. to gold and for really nothing that's the thing that's really sad he goes from rookie of the year and in the nba finals you know to a backup center who really can't even stay on the court because he has this like foot injury that Ends his career. I think he only spends a couple more years in Golden State. So it was. He's with Chris Mullen and Sleepy Floyd. Ooh, baby. <laughs> but uh, 87 88, um, he does uh, incredible in that. I just want to bring up in that postseason 37 and a half points a game. And it's still the most averaged for a single player in a single five game postseason series. They end up losing um, to Dallas, but still 37 and a half. Like, cause that, now he's now he's the money man. Like, there's no denying it. This is Hakeem's team in Houston. But uh, but they keep going out in the first round. They, yeah, this is almost like Chris Mullen in Golden State, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, 88, 89, they lose to Seattle. Um, but they do end up getting a uh, new coach, uh, Don Chaney, uh, in Houston. Well, this is where uh, uh, they're, they're trying to have this change where they realize that the Twin Towers aren't going to be a thing anymore and they're going to go through Hakeem and they need – new blood you yeah, know they need new players so they're revamping the roster unfortunately what's happening in the following seasons while well, Hakeem is playing great like 88 89 89 90 the team just can't break through the west no the team is not that good and the west is really good jazz supersonic suns blazers blazers yeah. and then we see him have this quadruple double Oh, I know. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Oh, my God. And that's an 89-90. He has 18 points, 16 rebounds, 10 assists, 11 blocks, one steal, just to put it on there. But and leading the league in rebounds in 88-89 and 89-90. I mean, he's just a force, man. Yeah. Um, but in 90-91, um, uh, Chaney is coach of the year. The team wins 52 games. Um, unfortunately, Hakeem is injured. I um, uh, got kind of an elbow from Bill Cartwright, so he can't qualify for the rebounding title, even though he led the league in rebounding. Yeah, he was like a couple of games short, and he still would have won because he was, I think in what, not this season, but one of the seasons, he was almost a two full rebounds ahead of Robinson, who was in second, yep. which is like, he was such a great rebounder. 91-92, uh, though, is when things kind of start getting testy between Hakeem and the front office. Yep. Um, they missed the playoffs in 91-92, um, and the front office, uh, like his, he's not a very, he's not a talkative guy. He doesn't like bring bullshit unless bullshit is in front of him, you Don't know? Don't start no shit, won't be no shit. Exactly. And that, it was his motto back then, I'm <laughs> just saying. But, uh, he wants more players around him because he can't, it's evident over the last three, four seasons, he can't do it by himself. Well, he feels like they're cutting corners and mm. not investing in the team they're they're making um they're they're not putting winning as their priority and 
the team is countering by saying he's faking injuries too, which to him is just like an assault on his character. Yep. And he wants, he either says, improve this team or I'm the hell out of here. I want to trade. Well, in a, not a, a move that is very uncharacteristic for him, he comes out and says some bad things about the owner. And then one of the beat reporters said he was all but traded. So yep. like it was pretty much set up and he was pretty much going to go. And then I saw this interview with him where he felt like that summer he needed to reassess and double down on his faith. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he got really back into his Muslim um, faith. And he said that he didn't like go to the owner and apologize, but he went and there opened up dialogue between them. Yeah. Just like, and that hey, was the, solve it. Yeah. That was the big thing that he said was just like, we were both just misunderstanding each other. And like, we both want the same thing to win. And then he ends up staying with Houston, which, and you know, he probably doesn't want to leave. It's where he went to college. I mean, it's probably the only part of America that he feels comfortable with too, yeah. you know, well, living in that he loves Houston. Yeah. And that's what he said was he was glad that he could figure this out and get, the assurance from the organization that they are going to try and put players around him and win. And the front office starts doing that. 92-93, leads the league in blocks, averages over 26 a game. He even had 3.5 assists per game. And yeah. that was one of the facets that is not necessarily overlooked, but he was a great passer. Like, he just understood the X's and O's of the game, very analytical about how we went about things, you know? Well, this is when they get the new coach. Yeah. So this is when they, they promote Tom Janovich. Yeah. This is when they promote Rudy from assistant coach and he gets him to start passing. Cause there was this talk about him being a selfish player. Yeah. His response, not. <laughs> his response was the players around me aren't good enough. A double team on me is better than an open guy who's going to miss, unfortunately. And this is what his big complaint was, was, look, I want to pass. The guys just aren't good enough around me. And then you see this start to build. Yeah, you see it really build. They make uh, this all the way to the second round of the play. They lose in game seven in overtime to the Sonics. To the freaking Sonics. Don't even exist anymore. But uh, it really sets up their run in 93-94. Yep. Where you really... They finally added all the pieces. You've got Mario Ellie, you've got Sam Cassell, you've got Robert Ori. I mean, this is like, it's time. Yeah. It's finally time, and the West is open enough. There are a lot of good teams, but it's not like where good teams go to die in the East in this era, where you eventually run into 23, you know? So 93-94, he leads the league in minutes per game. Yep. 41, um, 27.3 points a game, almost 12 rebounds, and a career-high 3.6 assists. And they roll right into the playoffs. And this, probably 93-94 playoffs, because this is the first year without Jordan, too. Yep. So everybody's licking their chops for a shot, you know? Um, first round, um, they go out and beat Portland 3-1 to one, and his friend Clyde the Glide. Uh, second round, a great series goes seven games. They beat the defending Western Conference champion Suns and Charles Barkley, ruin his dreams. And then in uh, Western Conference Finals, they beat uh, the Jazz, the Jazz in yeah. five games. Uh, sorry, mailman. I'm sorry, buddy. But uh, they make their uh, second NBA Finals, and they're playing old Patty Ewing. Well, it's it's this is one of these things that. The meetup is so great because Patrick Ewing denies him this championship, this NCAA championship mm -hmm. that he stays around to go and get. And then they meet up as the Rockets and the Knicks. So not Georgetown and, and Houston, but close enough. Yeah, right. And uh, this is for everyone who's not familiar. The OJ Simpson chase finals. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> right. Good old Nordberg and that white Ford Bronco. Mm. Mm -hmm. So let's skip all the way to game six. Knicks are up three to two. But they have to go back to Houston. That's right. Yeah. And, and old Pat Riley's coaching the Knicks at this time. Just to spiderweb that one off. So oh, yeah fucking pat riley who was coaching the lakers and commented on how great ewing or i mean how great uh hakeem was so uh john starks is just out there shooting his lights out oh absolutely <laughs> and they were saying that he he was just he was making so many shots from so many difficult angles that it was hard to stop this Nick's team because they for for this whole series they really beat up Hakeem. Yeah, but I mean that was the Knicks style of play. That yes. was the rough and tumble Knicks with like Ewing and Anthony Mason. And Mason, and yeah. After sticking it to uh Cheryl Miller's brother in the uh 
Eastern Conference playoffs. That's right. But yeah. this is if you watch this, it is so much more rough than. Oh, you can get away with oh, anything. God. Oh, man. And they played defense in the 90s. Well, and this is what was so great to go all the way back to Moses Malone toughening him up. Yeah. This is literally what he was saying was just like, if you're going to win an NBA championship, you're going to have to go through one of these teams. And, and you're going to it. have to play someone like me, like yes. Patrick Ewing. You're going to have to, you're going to get hacked mm -hmm. a lot. But. They win game six. Well, they, let, let's talk about this. Okay. Starks goes up. It uh, goes up for a game-winning shot. Oh, yeah. And Hakeem goes, and he stumbles a little, and then catches his balance and blocks it. Yeah. And people were talking about this because Starks was so hot that night, he was going to make that shot. Oh, totally. That yeah. shot was going in, and Hakeem just gets a fingertip on it just to barely deflect it. Oh, yeah. Rockets win game six, go to game seven. And John Starks isn't as hot in Game 7. <laughs> and the, all of the wind is out of the Knicks' sails. That's yeah. what they were saying was, like, if you watch this game... It's kind of depressing. Yes, because and the Rockets have it from literally the get-go. They just literally are just like, no, this is our championship. Hakeem goes 25-10. and 10. And if you think about it, this is after the 80s where you see Fi Slamma Jamma come close and never win it. You see the Astros losing in the NLCS in horrific fashion in 80 and 86. And the Rockets lose the NBA Finals in 1986. Yep. Like People were finally going from choke city to clutch city in the city of Houston as far as sports is concerned. And Hakeem balls out in Game 7. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. He's the only guy. He's named the Finals MVP yep. after they win. Only guy to win the MVP the finals MVP and defensive player of the year in the same season. That's incredible, man. Without a doubt, the best player because sometimes MVP and defensive player of the year is so separated. Yeah. In his case, it was like, no, I am that MVP on all fronts for my team. And this is just, and He's him the most being the only player, rocket. yeah, yeah. Him I mean, being the only player to ever do that, you're just like that is so. That makes so much sense. Yo, totally. Uh, the following year, Jordan comes back. A but, little bit later, yeah. but it's still kind of wide open. The Rockets start slow in 94-95. Um, they're dealing with some injuries, um, but they do acquire uh, midseason a very good player who's vital to their playoff run, an old friend from the University of Houston, Clyde Drexler. I thought this was very interesting because I, for some reason I always forget that he comes because he comes midseason. Yeah. He plays for them for just a tiny bit, mm -hmm. and he really improves this – struggling team because like you were saying the beginning of this season the houston the rockets looked like shit yeah uh, game average is a career high 27.8 points a game uh 10 uh, almost 11 rebounds and 3.5 assists but the problem is the team around him is just struggling yeah. they win enough games because they're talented enough but they're the sixth seed in the western conference yeah the team everyone is thinking is the odds on favorite to win in the west is the spurs with david robinson because they end up i think winning 62 games and the Rockets really have to scratch and claw the second the playoffs start. <laughs> they um, uh, upset the Jazz in five games in the opening round. And then uh, they end up playing the Suns, which goes to seven games. It's a fantastic series if you guys ever want to watch it. But um, they're down three to one in this series. Yeah. And they have to scratch and claw their way back. Um, they win... Uh, game five in overtime, they win game six, and then in game seven, they win 115-114 to 114 with Mario Eli's kiss of death three-pointer with 7.1 seconds left. So they eventually somehow beat the Jazz and the Suns, the three and the two seeds, and then they match up against old David Robinson in a Western Conference Finals that broke my eight-year-old soul. Well, this is, the, some, this is what people are saying, why Hakeem was possibly the greatest center of all time was when he matches up against other great centers a Ewing a Robinson whomever even a Barkley yeah. who's not a center but who's is their main focal point in the inside he always has better game so he's always better offensively and shuts them out defensively and Robinson won the MVP this year yes yeah and they both met and it was clear one player just brought it 
and Robinson didn't have a bad series. No. Hakeem had just an incredible series for the ages. He almost doubled his points, yeah. Robinson's points. And that's what people were saying was just like, no, no, no. Robinson had a good series. Hakeem had a, an amazing series. 35.3 points a game against a Hall of Fame center. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, and in the clinching game, he had 39 points, 17 rebounds, and five blocks. He led the team in scoring in all six games. Against the Admiral. Yeah. That's the thing that I always come back on is like he has these absolutely amazing series against the best centers. <laughs> and they asked Robinson how he was going to – they were like, how do you handle Hakeem? And he had a great quote. He said, Hakeem, you don't solve Hakeem. Yeah, you just pretty much are – he's going to do what he's going to do. Hopefully we could win. So they end up winning that series in six games. And then he has to play another fantastic center and his penis. And his penis. I and everybody that knows. Notes. Everybody knows who we're talking about at this point with Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> And the Orlando Magic. The Orlando Magic, who everyone was just... They already penciled them in as champions. Apparently, they recorded a rap video. Well, this is the Penny Hardaway. This is the... This is the magic that everybody thought was going to be the future. Kind of like this Rockets team that lost the finals. Back in the mid-80s, yeah. yeah. Uh Um, And they go up against Hakeem, and Hakeem makes it clear, like, no, 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 no. We're the champs. Yeah. You have to beat us. And thanks to some uh, crappy free throw shooting by Nick Anderson, it pretty much takes all the wind out of the Magic sails along with Hakeem. He misses four. Yeah. Four in a, a row. In a row. And I just want to say, if you ever want to look that up, that's something that breaks a human being. Nick Anderson is never the same afterwards. It's like Ralph Wiggum on The Simpsons after Lisa tells him off, look, Lisa, you can see the exact moment his heart breaks in half. <laughs> Just Sorry, hurts. It hurts. It, it hurts to watch. I can't even imagine the soul crushing this <sighs> experience. So they sweep the magic. They sweep them in Shaq's penis. And Shaq's penis, which we all know is difficult or not. We're waiting for evidence. Please, Twitter, show us. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Hakeem's the finals MVP again, um, which... Obviously. That's obviously. my thing with the the road even to the finals was he was so unbelievably good in these two years that... I, I, it's hard to say that he's not the best center ever, but it's, yeah. it's it's hard to compare people from different times. But still, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, he's literally wearing Will Chamberlain shorts at this juncture. Yes, I mean, that's right. Here we go. So uh, 95-96 has another good season, uh, almost 27 a game, 10 rebounds, but uh, they lose to the Sonics that year. The Sonics were really good that season. They yeah. made it to the finals, but obviously lost to that Bulls team. Um, 96, 97, Charles Barkley comes into the fold for I thought the that Rockets. Was, I thought that was interesting. We see what was thought to be a really good Rockets 1-2 in the bottom, and it, it just didn't work out in the playoffs. No, they lost the Western Conference Finals uh, to the not-New Orleans Jazz. Um, yeah. Came had a good season, though. Um, 97, 98, um, they lose in uh, round one, unfortunately. And then um, in 98, 99, they get Scottie Pippen. Yeah, Clyde the Glide uh, ends up retiring, and mm-hmm. they, try and, they try and slide Pippen into that role. And it just doesn't work. They lo- I mean, now it's like the beginning of his career. They're going in, and they're just losing in the first round. Yep. Um, they end up losing to the Lakers, Shaq getting a little revenge <laughs> along with Kobe. But um, Just a quick Shaq quote when, he, when Shaq went to the Lakers – um, they were comparing him to other Laker centers, like, oh, what's he going to be like? And Shaq just goes, don't compare me to Laker centers. Compare me to the greatest center ever, Hakeem Olajuwon. And this was him just off of him getting swept by him like two years earlier. So I imagine it was still like, yeah, he was the best. It's like, wow, I really got to improve my game now. Yeah. This guy's not going away for a little bit. <laughs> and uh, one more thing. Taco Bell had one of the best promotions ever yes. when they had their double crunch wrap taco and they had Hakeem and Shaq, Shaq being the crunchy, Hakeem being the soft taco. You guys know what I'm talking about. Delicious. Oh, Taco Bell. Um, next couple seasons, they end up missing the playoffs. And this, this is the juncture where the Rockets are starting to rebuild. They're getting like Steve Francis, Catino Mobley. They're getting smaller. And uh, he turns down in 2001 a $13 million uh, extension, and he's traded to the Toronto Raptors. 
And uh, I believe Muggsy Bogues is on this team. Yes, yes. Um, this was something I actually was a little bit bummed with. I wanted him to have his entire career to be in Houston. Yep. Um, just to point this out, he played basketball in Houston for 20 consecutive years. That's amazing. So four for the University of Houston, 16 for the Rockets. And then he essentially plays like half a season. Yeah, he retires in 2002. Um, also, his national team we didn't get into. Oh, um, yeah, let's get into that. He would have been on the 92 Dream Team. Unfortunately, he did not have his citizenship. Yep. Um, but... And he was prevented from playing beforehand as well. But in 1993, he becomes a U.S. citizen. And he's on the gold medal winning team in 96, playing with Shaq and David Robinson. And the rotation of that team is so insane. They were saying that, I think, well, there goes my Mike's thing. They were saying that he uh, only started two games, yeah. which is crazy. <laughs> but he's playing in them, and they're basically beating the crap out of every other team. Yes, um, uh, another interesting thing I found was uh, he had shoe deals with uh, Spalding. Yeah, he was the only big time player that didn't have a Nike, Reebok, Adidas deal. And his was, explanation was awesome, yeah. though. Yeah, go. You can go into it, man. Well, he said he was just like single moms can't go out there and pay one hundred and twenty dollars for something that then could put their kids' life in jeopardy for somebody yeah. stealing. It was just like, yeah, that's. You are so 100% right, because I think his shoes were selling for like 30 or 40 bucks. Yeah, it was just perfect. Um, and in 2008, he uh, was uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, um, finished his career with 21.8 points a game, 11.1 uh, rebounds, 3.1 blocks. I, I wanted to go into some of these things, though, right now. All-time block leader. All-time block leader at the time. Um, he retired in the top 11 in blocks, scoring, rebounding, steals, yep. which is crazy. And he was the only guy to, at the time of his retirement, finish in the top 11 across the board. That's so freaking good. Well, he w this is the thing, was he was a complete center. And yeah. he was in this era of amazing centers, and they say this was... This is what the other centers say about him, was that he was the best. And Shaq had said, I believe it was Shaq or Charles Barkley had said, you don't understand, Hakeem has 20 moves when he has the ball. He has five moves and four counters to them. It was impossible to, f to defend with his dream shake and his footwork. Like, I don't know if we're ever going to see another center like that again. Well, that's what they're saying. He, he might have had the greatest foot footwork ever and his dream shake like you were saying was it was so hard to decipher where it was gonna go it because was he had so many like counter fakes and fakes and you were just like was that what was that and it was like i said when he wanted to score he could pretty much score yeah well, he could do whatever he wanted on a basketball court which yeah. is insane but uh yeah hakeem Olajuwon, everybody